and also as a printer books are quite popular. And uh, he was uh, not just a teacher, he was also an administrator who was doing helpful. So he held uh, the position of an twice uh, in Stendhal. And uh, he also became uh, uh, the dean and a short, short student as a registrar also. And finally before arriving as the deputy director. So, uh, uh, he is not uh, uh, with us today in today's meeting, uh, but uh, I'm sure he will come uh, when he is able to discuss. But uh, uh, what to uh, thank each one of you for joining this lecture. We also have a live audience uh, uh, on YouTube joining this particular event uh, also. And I'm sure he will try not to support this lecture. I think it's about, uh, I'm going to take this, so 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Professor Zayn, Professor Zayn, my colleagues, uh, students here and others who are playing connected going through virtually. I understand this is being live. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, nice to see a uh, video on uh, physically here other kind of online trauma. So we would see only one face at a time, and uh, uh, we don't we don't know where the other person is actually. And, uh, but now it's a different kind of environment, and it is uh, actually for a different purpose. So that is, is for uh, listening to a uh, uh, great personality and for uh, technical lecture. It is not a kind of uh, like. And so outside kind of things, but still the hall is full, so that the talks are different. Like the dimension of uh, this event, and uh, it is a uh, kind of particular activity of most of the departments that uh, departments are doing for a dominant lecture, which is a really a very uh, good sign. So we can always listen to the topics in, the, in their field, and uh, we can enhance our understanding or our familiarity in the uh, area. And today is uh, that's another like opportunity. So they told me that it is the fourth and of lecture. This is second in physical book, and uh, unfortunately. Uh, be here uh, to listen to this lecture or to be part of this event. In fact, uh, when Professor Daniel called me up and uh, told them about this event, that also and so thing, uh, it is also and so time, uh, this is there. Then, even before he would formally invite me, I accepted that, that, that I told that I am joining there at least immediately. Then after that, he said, no, I'm, I'm, that's for that only I'm uh, calling you, and uh, this is, uh, I said it is, uh, like, uh, for sure I will be here, and I had to reach you too many things to be here uh, at this point of time. Uh, so, anyway, I'm very happy to be here, I'm here not uh, as a kind of, uh, like, my functional dignity and sort of things, but as a student of mechanical um, engineering, as a student of thermodynamics, and I have to Listen to Professor uh, Zira uh, for his uh, uh, whatever he's going to say very shortly. So I won't uh, waste much of time and then try and his own. And I hope all of you will get up and read some of his experience and vast knowledge uh, that Professor Zira has and that he's going to say uh, to next couple of minutes uh, through this lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you for the acceptability of the presentation and the mixing us in this field. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very good. And we are pleased to be a part of the physical audience once again. Now, without further ado, I would like to call this opportunity to introduce our speaker, who is having followed the board. With the talk of Professor Vikram Yeah, thank you, Dr. So, a lot of things to all of you have been for coming to this forum and covering the lecture series. So, today I'm interested with this responsibility of introducing Professor Vikram Jaira. So, uh, as people who are working in material science, this man does not need an introduction. We are all aware of his accomplishments and his achievements. So uh, we do not need an introduction, but the last student community presented its talk about the introduction. And then we have introduction in terms of the So Professor Vikram received his BA in Natural Sciences from Cambridge University and his PhD from Stanford University. Finally, we 
He joined the India Institute of Science, where he was the chair of the Department of Materials Engineering from 2009 to 2015. And the Bishop of Science Sciences 2015. He is exactly an honorary professor. His research from the Savage to the Ceramics, we have a big testing and a small scale mechanical testing. His current honorary programs. In the relation to the graphics, extensively in the progress of the brain, but in the past, in the RMP center, for example, in terms of the NDP works, measurement means for our He teaches those on actions and actual behaviors. So, this is the introduction of such a well being and next student of fire cylinder. I was fortunate to spend a lot of time in this company. Uh, from a market perspective, I would like to say that what made him stand out of the office was his ability to be in the So, in IRC and also here, I have just ended by thinking that it's pretty easy to be in the building. So, there are masses of building, but for Professor Jayaram, he's somebody who could learn a lot about how it's in many, many different domains at the same time. And in I never understood even one talk where he was present and he did not ask the most important questions. So, okay. so, so uh, I'm truly amazed by the and the knowledge that he has shown over the years and uh, it's by my knowledge that I give him as one of my knights. So, would you also have an opportunity for us to be a way to inspire and spread the mental knowledge as he takes us on a journey of universe of madness and the ingredients? So, without wasting a lot of time, I'm going to go to the center of the center and it's going to be the way of the flows. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. That's Professor Daniel. We always knew him as Sam. He changes his name every 10 years. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, of course. But it's also a great pleasure to come back and visit Root Key. I'm not a wonderful man visiting your uh, rock collection. And uh, this is the last to us around. If you haven't seen it, I suspect a lot of you haven't. You should go there and your archives. I'd like to thank uh, Sir Daniel and the other members of the department for this invitation and for your hospitality. You are my first two PhD students, full time PhD students, were from work. And uh, over the years, you know, exchanged many people. We take faculty and take PhD and so on. So uh, it's, very, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm very happy to be able to speak on the subject, which, as you will have noticed, has nothing to do with my research. And uh, some of you may be wondering why I'm talking about this. Um, in fact, I was a little hesitant. I suggested it this time because I wasn't sure whether he'd like the idea of my planning something. But uh, about three years ago, I began teaching a course on functional materials uh, to other graduates. And uh, one of the topics in functional materials that came up, it's not a very large topic. That there isn't enough time for it, is of course thermoelectrics. And even though I didn't expect more than half a lecture on it, uh, I, I like to understand what I'm saying, even if the students don't. Uh, I found that the origins of the concepts were somewhat obscure. If you think about it, the electricity is very old. But it doesn't quite fall within the realms of thermodynamics because it relates to a transport process. It's an, it's an irreversible process. And most of the textbooks and articles that I read focused on the practical aspects, you know, ZT, including the 
um, quality factor of densities of so states and so on. So it, it's a journey that I went through, which I'm going to recall, of a very backwards to see where the concept developed and what it really meant. And I'll, I'd like to share that with, with you today. So I'm going to trace this history through three people. Really a little too, that's Kelvin and Oxalan. Several of us have been talking about heat of heat and uh, one of the very powerful characters in heat, which uh, uh, is not thought about too much, is Daniel uh, Thompson, Count Rumford. So I'll just spend a little slide on him because these are all interesting characters. We know them from the standpoint of their scientific contributions, but they were also in interesting in many other ways. So again, I think uh, the topic is also a little appropriate given the interests of Professor Kapoor who went back this lecture. And he was a doyen of extractive methodology in the application of thermodynamics to extraction processes. So I hope you'll find it interesting. Anyway, let's see. So let me start. I have just one slide on count. Okay. I have just one slide on He's such a fascinating character that suffers a lot. So, some of you who have read about this subject will know that he was around who worked Ferns and Cannons, or at least made the relationship between work done in making Ferns and Cannons and the fact that it ended up having to be cooled. And so he measured the temperature that is in the water. And, and through the connection, this, this, yeah. at that time, the, the theory of heat involved a fluid color, which uh, went in and out. And this was sort of developed because he took the material before and after and showed it was exactly the same. The mass of the material was the same. The properties were the same. Uh, he was not the sort of person to find detail and prove rules that was left to people like Clausius and Kelvin and so on. But that, that this, these experiments went a long way towards questioning the current theories. Then he went on to do other things. He was a practical man. And a very, uh, shall we say, eclectic in his interests. He secured his financial future by marrying somebody who had his mother who had a lot of money. Her husband had died. And he had tremendous charm. He said he was able to get everybody to do anything he wanted. And so he was so politically very savvy. So he first fought with the Americans against the British, and then when he realized that that was not a smart thing to do, he went and fought with the British against the Americans. He was nearly arrested, but then in England, of course, the king he was fighting for was also incompetent, and so the American colonies were lost. And then he went on to Bavaria to become prime minister. So if you, if you didn't read this, you wouldn't imagine people would do things like this. And that is where he became Count Rumford. And then one of his um, activity was the illumination of beggars. This was a big problem apparently in those days. There were people just begging and making a nuisance of themselves in the streets. So he took it as a mission. And, you know, and his way of solving the problem was to create what we now call soup kitchens. And the soup there was not particularly good. So there was an incentive to stop sitting there and drinking soup and going off and getting jobs. But, from the relevance of the standard of dynamics, the you know, in order to cook food, he needed efficient stoves. So he experimented extensively on how to make stoves efficient. And we've had the time for the kitchen there, the double browser, now the, the pressure cooker, and the drip coffee maker. So an interesting man, and that's where, shall we say, a point at which the modern theory of heat, which is subsequently um, encapsulated in the laws of thermodynamics by many other people, began. So now let's go to the next person in this, in this episode. Oh, oh, before that, okay. Now, 1826. This is where the Seebeck effect was discovered. So it is reminding you what the Seebeck effect is. So if you had a, a junction at some temperature T2, which is hotter than T1, and you connect them by 
two different wires, wires are two different materials, then you get a current flow. Now, the way the current flows also involves pumping heat. Okay. The temperature which is higher is the temperature where heat is absorbed, and the temperature which is lower is the one where heat is evolved. So this is a bit like back EMF. You know, when you run a motor, and as the motor spins up, there's also a back EMF generated, which is in opposition to the applied voltage. This is exactly the same. If you didn't have it like this, the hot junction would be getting hotter, and the cold junction would be getting cold, and you know that can't be done. So this emerged out of the web of Seabed in 1826, and he found that a circuit made from two dissimilar materials uh, deflected a compass magnet. He knew the long conclusion that this was due to magnetism. But it was connected because Hester just a few years ago had shown that uh, uh, a moving current could produce a magnetic field. And based on this result, he carried out extensive experiments to establish what we would call today as a thermoelectric series. It's a bit like the galvanic series. But later, there was a watchmaker in France. It was kind of the, if you pass the current through a junction, that you could either absorb or emit heat. So, depending on the direction of flow of the current. If you flow it, uh, if you flow it one way, then you would get absorption, and the other way you get emission. And the use of that, it was also shown that you could simply freeze small quantities of water by passing um, through the metal. This is where things stood. It's a phenomenon, but there was no real understanding of what was going on. So this is where Kelvin came to the picture. Now, this is not Kelvin. This is actor who plays Kelvin. In the recent adaptation of the movie around the world in 80 days. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's one with Jackie Chan. And Kelvin was portrayed as a villain there. It seems to be in a favorite because he was also a villain in a Japanese series book. I'm not quite sure why Kelvin was seen as a villain. But in this particular movie, he showed us the president of the Royal Society, which was, takes on this bet and then uses our hands and other skin that we to prevent the famous foul thing. He was not a stranger to controversy. And one of the biggest controversies began with the age of the earth. So it's particularly appropriate after spending all of my time looking at your museum today. I don't know if any geologists in the audience, but number 17, he took the calculations, the, the, uh, the analysis of Fourier, who at that time had just come up with a series approach to analyzing heat conduction. To estimate the age of the Earth. And the way you do this is by making some assumptions, obviously. You start with a ball of molten rock, and then the outside. So, what we've got here is the temperature, and this is a depth. So, that's the surface of the Earth, and this is going up to 300 kilometers in depth. Depending on the age, you can measure a certain temperature gradient on the surface. So, if you had a steep gradient between the Earth's jump, you had a shallow gradient between the Earth's root. So, remember, this is a steep gradient, this is a shallow gradient. Here, we have to make a lot of approximations. So, this little shading shows you the range in which he estimated the age of the Earth to be. And that was between 10 and about 3 or 400 million years. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem because if you think about Competing theories. After this calculation came, of course, was Darwin's theory of evolution. And that requires the Earth to be hundreds of millions of years after it pulled down to support life. So this age was simply too short. The church, well, because the church probably came up with another, which is very much smaller. And then it was estimate was hundreds of millions of years max, be smaller. Geologists, Time, believe it, lived forever. And there's a very interesting conversation between Kelvin and uh, Scottish geologist. I'll read it out because you may not be able to see it from that. I asked, this is Kelvin speaking, I asked Ramsay how long the time he allowed for the history of the geological history of Scotland. He said he would suggest no limit to it. I said, one billion years? He said, yeah. Ten billion years? He said, yes. 
So the sun is a finite body. You can tell us how many tons it is. You think it has been shining for a trillion years? So at this point, I think the geologists were fed up. And so and as in children of estimating and understanding your reasons for limiting geological time, as you are incapable of understanding our reasons for our unlimited estimates. Uh, there, there's a further continuation of the conversation, but let's leave it at that. So, how was this eventually resolved? For those of you who may have encountered this, the popular notion is that this was resolved by radioactivity. So, I'll tell you the argument is also not that correct. And this was popularized by Lord Rutherford when he gave a talk at the Royal Society. And when he came to the room, he saw Kelvin in the audience and he knew he, he, his estimates of the age of the Earth would be uh, would contradict what Kelvin believed. And he was a little nervous. He says, to my belief, he fell fast asleep. But as I came to the important point, I saw the old bird sit up, open an eye, and caught the brain from times at me. Then suddenly inspiration came. I said, Lord Kelvin, I'm looking at the age of the Earth. So why did no new source of heat was found? But Prophet Vigatorans refers to what we are now considering, namely radium. And behold, the old boy beamed at me. Now, the generation of heat inside the Earth would, of course, give you a shallow gradient, even though the, uh, the, the Earth was very old. This was not the actual reason. The amount of heat generated through radioactivity is not enough. And it turns out that the reason is more related to the fact that heat from the inside can actually come to the outside. So your gradient is actually smaller than the thing. It has nothing to do with the age as assumed if you simply have connection. And this theory was proposed by somebody who we would call today a project assistant. He was somebody working with Kelvin, and because he was a lowly project assistant, he was completely ignored, including by Kelvin. But the theory essentially is what we know today as core mantle convection, where material from the Earth's interior can slowly, over hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, move into the top surface and therefore transport heat as well. Anyway, this is all by the way. What did Kelvin do with electricity. This is what he said. And he said this talking about the same time that Bruki was started. This is around 1845. 1845 to 1852, the, the papers came out. The laws of thermodynamics had just been uh, put into form by him, Clausius, and other people, you know, the experiments of Joule and so on. What he said was the flow of the tunnel can be converted into heat into two ways. And it's purely dissipative, that's what you'd call as warming heating. But the other was a reversible con conversion of heat into work that followed the same laws as a carbon cycle. And which he assumed was proportional to first order in current. So you have I squared R and you have something else which is proportional to I. In other words, when heat flows from a hotter region to a colder region, it can do work. And then you could apply the second law of thermodynamics to this process. Now, this is very daring, and he was very clear to say that this was an assumption because this is not a classical reversible change in the vicinity of equilibrium. The thermoelectric effect requires that two regions be at a finite difference in temperature. So, equilibrium the thermodynamic sense cannot exist. But nevertheless, he went ahead and applied So, this was his thought experiment of thermoelectricity. He imagined a series of metals. Well, the last two here next to each other were the same at the same temperature, and then junctions at very different temperatures. Now, if you balance the, the applied voltage and the, and the work done here, you can, you can do this in different ways. You can short circuit these two, in which case you simply get a current flowing, or you can run a dynamo here and balance the voltage against the internal voltage so that the, uh, the, there's no net current flow. This is a classical way in which we Look at a battery, for example. We either measure the voltage of the high impedance or we measure the current by short circuiting. So, the two terms here on the right. So, the gamma is the current here. I'm just using his terminology. F is the external voltage. A is what you would call the thermoelectric voltage. And B is your internal resistance. So, this is only heating, and these two are well terms. 
So the first law and the second law will do the following. If alpha t is a heat absorbed by unit current, then this relationship holds. And if alpha t times, that is the voltage times current by temperature, the sum of these, of course, is dq by t. And that is your total entropy change, which remember this is not a reversible change, but you assume that you could use reversible laws, but that sum must be zero. So these are the two laws, and these are alphas, of course, but the question was not really. They represent in some way what happens in two separate cases. The first case is a junction at some temperature between two metals, let's say two and three. And the other is a single metal where two ends are at two different temperatures. So those are the two situations you're looking at. So what is the latest contribution to alpha? The conversion of current to heat at one junction, two to the same temperature, what we call the Peltier effect, and the conversion of current to heat in the temperature gradient in a single material, which is what later came to be called the Thompson effect. Of those is what you uh, observe as CBEC. So, you just going through this, it's not very difficult. The, the first law tells you the healthier coefficients plus the sigma here is what we now call the Thompson coefficient. Uh, it gives you one equilibrium, and the entropy terms gives you the other equilibrium. And if you now take these large numbers and reduce them to just two metals, and then two, you will recover the what we tell them what are the Kelvin relationships Oops. in thermal electricity. So this is the first equation which tells you the temperature derivative of the Peltier effect is a CPEC effect plus the Thompson effect, a Thompson coefficient, and the Peltier coefficient itself is alpha t. I just want you to appreciate what has been achieved in 1845. It's a completely general theory. All the coefficients can change with temperature. There's no assumption there. So the key to the first is assume the flare and you the wire and then escape through the sites. These approximations have to be there. You can make Julie heat negligible by making the current arbitrarily small. Because the goes as I. So if you make I sufficiently small, you can make the resistive contribution very small. But Kelvin did not know what electricity was, and he didn't care. This treatment he didn't care about mechanisms. Energy bands, Fermi level, all this was 75 years into the future. So thermal electricity is an excellent example of the power Cyberdynamics to rise about the niceties of mechanisms. We can develop that for five series, even when I want to have this well. So, if we now put this together, we can write that the current density that you have is a function not only of the electrical potential gradient, but also the temperature gradient. So, we can sort of generalize this. Similarly, the density of heat flow. It's a combination of the Peltier effect. What happens to people? Thank you very much. Now, we have the next question. This is, of course, the traditional terms which relate a current flux to a potential gradient and a thermal flux to a temperature gradient. So, what about these two? They go the other way. And the question was why is it that both these coefficients are the same? And this is the question that next we needed to be answered. So, so getting to that, it's worth like looking at this whole concept of driving forces and fluxes and responses of a system. So let me the clapping on equation, which tells you the change of free energy as a function of the change in temperature and the change in pressure. This is something we all learn in chemistry. So, suppose you have ice and water, we know that a little bit of ice melts. The net free energy change is simply the difference in the entropy multiplied by the change in temperature and the difference in the specific volume multiplied by the change in pressure. If the system reveals an equilibrium, the PG is zero, and so T and P need to follow a specific function. Now, this principle is used now, and there's a startup company in the US 
which is trying to be responsible for an aggregation system or a refrigeration system, which has no moving parts and which has no um, uh, flow balance or any uh, of the conventional methods of moving. And that's using the shape memory alloy and the heat change due to the austenite martensite conversion and the martensite austenite conversion. One absorbs heat, the other emits heat. So if you exploit that, you can go through a compression expansion cycle, which will take heat from region you want to cool somewhere else. But you also know that if you take the second derivative of G with respect to P and T, you can do it in two different ways. You can do it first with P and then T, and then first with T and then P. If you do that and say that the answer is the same, you come up with this strange conclusion that the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient is the same as a rate of change of entropy with pressure. Now you can say why that is going on, I don't know, that's kind of rubbish. But it is, it's not very intuitive. So this sort of relationship comes from just melting around with the fact that these are state functions and it doesn't depend on how you get them. You see other examples like this. If you have electrostatic energy, I'm not going to read all this, but essentially you know when the directly constant one two, which is the change in the electric displacement along one of your life field long is the same as two one when you reverse the two directions. And the argument is exactly the same. And those of you who teach that dynamics will get great pleasure in torturing students with uh, relationships like this. Now, as these apply to equilibrium processes, they do not apply, uh, apply to universal processes in welding transport. So, we know how to look at forces and fluxes where things are actually not in equilibrium, things are changing. Let's take the case of water in a bucket, which cools. We know that if you leave water out, in cool below I mean terms of and this is the principle of evaporative cooling, where you put the water in mud pots. The radiance and weather will have to be really dry evaporation. So that's where the water is not evaporating, as long as the, the water is in the atmosphere, uh, it doesn't get saturated. On the other hand, the radiance is temperature and heat conduction. So if you don't have radiance, like if you don't have high of conductivity, you can maintain a large difference between your outer temperature and your outside temperature. The next question is, can gradients of one quantity drive a flux in something that does not eliminate the original gradient? So if you have a temperature gradient, you get heat flow, basically it tries to eliminate that gradient. It's the same with a potential gradient. This happens all the time. So an example of this is that a mixture of gases in a temperature gradient, separate partially, this is, that is thermal gradients can drive mass transport. And this works by itself as a recess. And this is attempted in the early days as, as a means of separating U238 from U235. This is really what the Seebeck coefficient is all about. Which brings us to this gentleman, his name, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was last on Salva, who introduced the concept of entropy changes during a change, during the production of entropy. He is an interesting man. He was very brilliant. His faculty colleagues wouldn't understand him. Unfortunately, they uh, put him to teach undergraduate first year chemistry. So suddenly the undergraduates didn't understand him. And so he was sacked. He was sacked from Johns Hopkins. He went to Brown, where he wrote his famous was on reciprocity, which later won the Nobel Prize. But he was, uh, well, it says let go from Brown because they couldn't, at the time of the Depression, immediately prior to the Second World War and so on, they couldn't afford to keep him on the basis of his teaching. Um, those were not days when universities had big research budgets. So when he settled in Yale, which is where Gibbs had done all his work a few decades before, and then he wrote his PhD. And that's an interesting story, because when the president of Yale decided that all the professors should have PhDs, so his department had called him and said, on Saturday, why don't you write up some thesis? We'll get it evaluated and then we'll have a PhD. So on Saturday, I wrote up a thesis on uh, Matthew's equation, 
with any mathematicians here, you know that this equation gives you the modes of vibration of an elliptical membrane. And a sort of time you use it to draw. Now, he's to understand the head or tail of the thesis. So he drew off the name and sent it to leading experts around the world to get a non-biased evaluation. Well, you know what happens in these cases. All deeds of academic affairs know what happens when you send out a thesis. The examiner says yes and then doesn't respond. Uh, so we were going sending commanders. And he came back with a response said, well, Thank you for sending me the thesis. Uh, this is very erudite and very profound work. I can't pretend I have understood much of it. But what I really don't understand is why you sent it to me. You should have sent it to Ansaka. So that's how he got his PhD. So I've, I've given you a simple fact. I'm not sure the references from where I got all of this. I didn't dream of this up. Uh, to illustrate what is meant here. So I have a reservoir. Oops. Suppose I had a reservoir at T and another reservoir at T plus DT, and I have a slab in between. So as is customary in thermodynamics, this is infinite. So this serves at T, this is also infinite. So it is going to at that temperature. But the gradient of the slab is also fixed. This, these two ends don't change in temperature. So there's a fixed heat flow. The loss of entropy on one side is that, and the gain of entropy almost at the law, but it, the, the gain JQ is going in this direction. The loss of entropy here is uh, D, JQ by T. The gain of entropy here is JQ by T plus DT. Well, what's the difference? The difference is this quantity, which can be written in this form, and it must be produced somewhere. Remember, the system doesn't change. So its entropy has to remain fixed because its temperature remains the same. So the way you argue this is to say that the entropy is produced in the bar. This additional difference between what this loses and what this gains. So the rate of production of entropy here is a flux times a driving force. So that is your fundamental relationship that relates entropy production to uh, the change which is happening in this irreversible change. Now you can generalize this. Uh, you can generalize the entropy change, not just to heat, but also to matter flux. So there you have to bring in the chemical potential. And then you do one more thing. So you have a, a, a flux of internal energy and a gradient in temperature, one by T, and you have a flux of matter at the gradient of G by T, where G is your Free energy. Once I have made the additional assumption, which we make routinely, each of these fluxes is also proportional to the gradients. Whereupon you can write it in this manner. So let's just look at this one here. Flux of heat is proportional to the temperature gradient and also to the temperature potential gradient. And the flow of mass is also proportional to the chemical potential gradient, which is normal, and the temperature gradient. Whereupon you get these two tidal coefficients here. And what he said out to prove was that B is equal to C. Okay. So here's an outline of the proof. So we have this. In terms of driving forces, and he uses x for the driving force, and these coefficients. The coefficients, if this were a flux and a concentration gradient, there would be diffusivities. I'm sorry, I missed a slide here. Let me, let me just go through this first. So, to build up to the argument, let's just look at what happens in equilibrium in a system where there are no compositional changes. So the system that he took was a sugar which exists in three different forms, uh, galactose in this case. If the system is an equilibrium, then A can go to B, B can go to C, and C can go to A. This is the equilibrium that exists. Now the rate of change of A 
depends on how fast A is eliminated into B and C, and how fast B and C become A. So you can write these three equations. And at equilibrium, if the values of A, B, and C, and A, and B, and C are same with the stars, then the rate of change will be zero. And so you get three equations here. But you have six coefficients. That is, you have KAB, KBA, AC, CA, CB, and BC. But chemists routinely assume that the rate of change of A to B is the same as B to A in equilibrium. That is, equilibrium is maintained individually. If you did not assume that, you would have to assume that equilibrium is maintained by psychic reactions. That is, A to B, A to B, B to C, and C to A. This is never believed to be the case. So, let's generalize this a little further. You can extend this. If you go slightly away from equilibrium, you can once again write the rate of change. So, XA here is by how much A, the concentration of the of A, deviates from the equilibrium quantity. And you can write it in terms of a driving force, which is what's called a capital X. The, the spirit of bonds are here, and a coefficient. And the coefficients are the same K, A, B, K, B, A. There's some additional terms here just to put it in this particular terminology. So, again, you would believe that these two have to be equal, these two would have to be equal, and these two would have to be equal. So, the problem he took was a follow. That is heat conduction in a crystal with six force symmetry. So these are the heat conduction equations. The rate of heat flow is written in a slightly different way. That's because it's not written in terms of the tetra gradient, one by t times dt by dx. But if you have six force symmetry, you can draw from symmetry laws that these coefficients have to be zero. It is the six force axis is along the x3 axis. If you assume that clockwise and anti-clockwise rotations are the same, then everything becomes zero. So what we would do is to differentiate clockwise and anti-clockwise rotations, which means that L12 is equal to minus L1. And the task is to show that these two are also equal. So if they're equal and also equal to the negative, they have to be zero. So this is the simplest case. You only have one coefficient, everything else is zero. What he does is you use the energy density of the crystal. So this is where you move from the idea of equilibrium to how equilibrium is actually present in a crystal in, in, in a material. The energy density we call this E. What is it? It could be an enthalpy, it could be anything else, which represents, let's say, a product of a field and a response which amounts to an internal energy multiplied by x1, which is a linear dimension, and integrated over the volume. So x1 is a distance from the centroid. So if the energy density is uniform, or if it's symmetric, then this quantity will be zero. If it changes from zero to zero, it means there's a temporary fluctuation. Okay? So the mean fluctuation of x1 and x2 will be zero. The product of the two will also be zero because there's no correlation between fluctuations along x1 and x2. And the square of the fluctuations will be equal in both directions. And these underlevels represent time averages. So this is now the end of the argument here. Every fluctuation, we I think I missed a slide. Let me just go back. So this is the outline of the proof here. Thermodynamic equilibrium is a dynamic process. It is not a static process. It's a dynamic process in which molecules exchange energy. The configurations keep changing, but the overall distribution remains the same. This is what we always understand. The reversibility of molecular velocity suggests that if you have two configurations A and B, the likelihood of going from A to B is the same as going from B to A. Because you just reverse the velocities, you will, you, you'll go back in the opposite direction. Likewise, the key point, even in equilibrium, fluctuations occur. The larger the fluctuation, the less likely it is. 
And this is really the key to the whole argument. The microscopic fluctuations returns to equilibrium. It's the same as how the system responds to an external driving force. So if you think about it, if I think of a system at one temperature, but then I put heat in from the other side, I have disturbed the equilibrium and heat is conducted along the pipe. But if a system is at constant temperature and there is a momentary fluctuation in which one region becomes hotter than another, that will also come back to equilibrium. And the way in which it does that is exactly the same as what it would do if I had an external driving force. So that, that's really the sum and substance of the argument. So let's get back. So every fluctuation is associated with an average microscopic temperature gradient along x1. So if you take out alpha 1, it's about x1. So the question he poses is, what is the probability the value of alpha 1 at time 0 is followed at a time later by the fluctuation x2 or alpha 2 along x0? This is basically the probability that a thermal gradient along one leads to a flux of root two. That, that's really what the sum and substance is. And he shows that that is equal to alpha n squared. And if you do the reverse, then we calculate that a thermal gradient along two leads to a flux along one. Remember that L12 is minus L21. You end up with minus L12 alpha 2 squared. So these are the two quantities. And because this mean square fluctuations of alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the same, it follows that these two have to be equal. So they're equal, then they have to be zero because they're also equal to their negative. So let's see how this is applied. Supposing we have three different effects all happening at the same time. Supposing you had a temperature gradient and an electrolyte, you can have flow of mass, you can have flow of charge, and you can have flow of heat. So you can have these, the, the conventional diagonal coefficients here are the familiar ones. Heat flux due to temperature gradient, flux due to voltage gradient, and mass flux due to the chemical potential gradient. The others, how would you call it? Diffusion and electro diffusion. And they relate fluxes of one kind to gradients in potential of another kind. So we're coming to the end now, and that is some electrics. So if you now apply whatever we've so far and look at the entropy production rate, it can now be written in terms of a heat flux. And in terms of a flux, and here is the number of electrons moving in unit area every time. So we have a flux of these two and the corresponding driving force. The driving force of the heat is the uh, uh, one by two, the gradient of you know, one by t, and chemical potential for the case of the electrons. Now, this is the way in which it can be written. And these are what would be called the onside coefficients here. And here we have now assumed that the diagonal coefficients are the same. Namely, the coefficient that relates electron transport to the gradient in temperature is the same as which relates heat transport to the uh, gradient in chemical in, in electrical potential. What are these quantities at L in terms of what we now know to be C vector and thermal? Conductivity and electrical conductivity. Well, I'm just writing these just so that they're familiar at the top of every slide. What we call electrical conductivity is nothing more than the flux of charge divided by the electric field when there are no temperature gradients. That's what we mean by electric field, electrical conductivity. So this term vanishes because there's no gradients in temperature. So this allows you to relate what we call electrical conductivity to this on socket coefficient L1. If you do something similar with thermal conductivity, what we call thermal conductivity is the heat flux per unit temperature gradient when there is no electron flux. 
not when the voltage potential is zero, when the current flux is zero. So this quantity here now becomes zero on the left. So if you put that equal to zero and you do some manipulation, you now get the thermal conductivity in terms of these various parameters of the target coefficients. I don't have to see the coefficient. So this is the way in which you can imagine this. Uh, this is taken from Callan's book, by the way, in thermodynamics. So you have A and you have B, and this is one junction at T1 and one junction at T2. And if you have a low voltage here, so the high being set up, so there's no current flag, the difference in potential between these two points, which is what you want to measure, and that's the uh, the, the, the voltage that's developed due to the temperature gradient, is given by this integral. Take the derivative of this potential. Remember, this is the mu divided by E, simply the voltage. If you take the derivative, you simply get dB by dt, which is the C by coefficient. And that is simply this quantity. L12 by L11 for A, and as L12 by L11 for B. So this automatically tells you that each material is characterized by its own C by coefficient, uh, if you establish a standard. Uh, which depends on this ratio of L12 by L11. You can do something likewise for the Peltier effect. The way we apply boundary conditions are the current of the two sides is the same. And so mu and Jn are the same. So what is changing here is that Ju minus Jq has to be the same on both sides. Now, to put it in today's language, J minus JB of the internal energy is what we would call the Fermi level in the two materials. And that difference is manifest as JQA minus JQB, which is heat. So if you go one way, you involve heat, you go the other way, you absorb heat. And so the temperature coefficient, and then we written in terms of the temperature and the C back coefficient, which is a famous second Kelvin equation. So, in a sense, all we've done is we derive everything. But the assumption that Kelvin made that you would apply the first law, the, 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 the laws of thermodynamics to a transport process, is what has been put on a firm mathematical foundation by this process of relating how the system responds to a small change by equating that to the way in which, at equilibrium, it deals with fluctuations. This is the final summary. The familiar way of looking at it is that your current density depends on your voltage gradient and your temperature gradient. And your heat flux depends on these quantities in the usual way. And the right side way of looking at the same equations would be it's, there's nothing different. But what's changed here is that the coefficients are not the temperature gradient, but the gradient of 1 by t. And so you will see very clearly here that, here that the coefficients of the off the components are the same. Both of them are exactly the same. And you also see that when you look at heat conduction, it brings out clearly that the flux of heat is not just related to the thermal conductivity. It's also related to the Seebeck coefficient because you cannot distinguish the two forms of heat. If you have current flowing, you will have heat produced, and it will conduct along the wire in the same way as if you had uh, a temperature gradient. So these are the references. Maybe uh, you can send them to you. Uh, the, the hardest thing to get were not Kelvin's collected papers, where these were first time, and more than about 75 years ago. I'm, I'm very grateful that the University of Cambridge Library in there, he sent it to me. I, I couldn't find it in any other way. I said, I'm an alumnus, please, please, please. And then various textbooks, and of course, on Saga's famous article in 1931. And some of these are available on the internet. Actually, if you just search, you can find all this. You don't need the uh, uh, um, access to anything special. They're all available to your library, I'm sure. So with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Well,
the lecture. Thank you, Sir, for the honor of the words. Now, I would like to extend a word of thanks. I will begin the academic process of India Chaitanya, for instance, Elder Mother Sauron. We are waiting for the readings of Chaitanya Mahatma's British Academy and we are here to study. We are also thankful for the Thank you.